It was a splendid population. For all the slow, sleepy, sluggish brain sloth stayed at home. You never find that sort of people among pioneers. You cannot build pioneers out of that sort of material. It was that population that gave to California a name for getting up astounding enterprises and rushing them through with a magnificent dash and daring and a recklessness of cost or consequences, which she bears unto this day. And when she projects a new surprise, the grave world smiles as usual and says, well, that is California all over. No other state had come into being quite like California. Before California's admission to the Union, each state had to pay its dues first by spending years as a territory. The U.S. government required a population of 60,000 residents before a territory could become eligible for statehood. Emigration to California prior to the gold rush had been so slow that it would have taken decades for the territory to reach the 60,000 mark. Once the quiet discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill broke loose in the early months of 1848 and the word spread across the globe, the boom in people traversing the nation and the oceans to enter California made the population explode in a way no other place on earth had ever encountered up until that time. When it came time for California to become a state, Congress wanted the eastern border to be at the crest of the Sierra Nevada mountains. This did not sit well with the Californians because they knew all too well that the Sierras were full of gold. They drew their own border, running in a line just to the east of the Sierra Nevadas. They were keen on keeping all the gold that their state had to offer. To the south, they drew their border along the Colorado River out of concerns for water. Congress was reluctant to agree, but feared that if they did not, they would be at risk at losing all of the territory west of the Colorado Mountains. They could not risk California attempting to form its own republic. California got to create its own borders, and the United States brought its 31st state into the Union. Spoils of the Mexican-American War were plentiful for Americans in terms of land. They purchased California, along with Alta California, New Mexico, which contained what would one day become Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. And they set Texas' southern border at the Rio Grande once and for all. While Mexico's defeat stung the pride of that nation, they had never colonized their lands to the full potential. California and the neighboring territories were sparsely populated at best by the Mexican people. One can only speculate whether Mexico would have signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago if they had known that just a few days earlier, gold had been discovered in the land that they had fought to keep. The war may very well have continued, and America's landscape might have been drastically different. The growth and rapid change in California can be best symbolized by one of its most bustling cities during the gold rush, San Francisco. San Francisco grew so fast that often the legs it was standing on could not support the weight the city had to bear. Before the gold rush, this sleepy little city had less than 1,000 inhabitants. A few nuggets of gold created a shockwave around the globe. The city was hurriedly built to accommodate all those that flooded into the Bay Area. The city would pay the price for such hasty construction. It would burn to the ground, be rebuilt again, only to reach the same fate as it had before. Ships in the harbor that were abandoned by their gold-hungry crews would often be sunk and made into landfill, helping to further extend the city out into the bay, or they would be used as storage for a city that was growing at an alarming rate. The harbor would be so crowded with ships that it sometimes took days for crews to unload their cargo 
and passengers. Some of the abandoned ships that were not turned into landfill would be disassembled, and those timbers would be used in the hasty construction of buildings such as inns, dry goods stores, saloons, restaurants, and hotels, all just to accommodate the ever-growing number of miners entering the city. The people came first, but the thought towards the infrastructure they would need came second. If you left Gold Rush-era San Francisco for a month and returned, you would return to a city you could barely recognize. Change and growth were happening at a dizzying pace. Those immortal words of Sam Brannan, gold, gold in the American River, would ring out across the world and people of every nationality would crowd into San Francisco. The small, sleepy city grew seemingly overnight. The rapid growth and the transient nature of the people who inhabited the city would forever be a city planner's nightmare. There is a fast mode of doing business in California which had to be adopted to keep up with the times. The city was booming, and the rush for gold permeated every aspect of the lifestyle of the California in the 1850s. Fortunes were made and lost overnight, and the landscape of one of its great cities was fluctuating right along with it. From the start of San Francisco's accelerated growth at the beginning of the gold rush in 1848, to just three years later in 1851, various parts of the city would be consumed by six great fires. The first blaze occurs on December 24, 1848, and it would take over $1 million worth of property and reduce it to ash. A mere six months later, a second fire breaks out in the early hours of the morning, and this time, the flames take three blocks of the city's most valued buildings at a cost of around $4 million. This fire was suspected to be arson and would cause several city ordinances to be put into immediate action. These ordinances were put in place in the hopes that they would keep any future blazes in check by being both a deterrent to anyone who might think of setting one and to keep the citizens of the city better prepared if another blaze should break out. Households were required to keep six buckets of water on hand and at the ready in the event of another fire. Citizens were also expected to assist in the extinguishing of fires or to help in the removal of items from a burning building or a building that was in danger of catching fire. If they refused this charge, each citizen could be fined no less than $5, but no more than $100. Despite these measures, the blazes continued. Just one month later, on June 14th, a third major fire broke out inside the city. This time, the cause of the fire was a defective chimney in a bakery. The wind was blowing that morning, and it did not take long for several blocks of the city to become engulfed in flames and lost to any hope of salvation. Slowly but surely, San Franciscans began to realize that they could not keep constructing buildings and living the way that they did. Fireproof brick buildings were more expensive to erect than the more traditional wooden ones, but in the long run, they became the cheaper option because of their stability and resistance to the flame. Some houses would be erected with walls that were two to three feet thick of solid brick. In addition to the changing tide of the architectural style, more firefighting departments began to form, but still, the city of San Francisco would see more fires. On the anniversary of the first great fire of the city, a sixth blaze would occur. This time, it was estimated that there was more damage from this one fire than from all the others that came before. On this particular occasion, the blaze begins in a paint and upholstery store that was located on the south side of the plaza. Yet again, malfeasance was suspected, and again, to aid in the destruction, the wind was blowing. 
The wooden, planked streets are consumed, and the wind soon carries the fire into the business district. It was said that the light from the fire could be seen as far as 100 miles out to sea. In a matter of only 10 hours, between 1,500 and 2,000 houses had been completely lost, and 18 blocks of the main district are completely destroyed by the sixth fire. The damage extended three quarters of a mile north to south and the third of a mile east to west. The total damages amount to more than $12 million. Only five brick buildings in the area's hit would survive the flames. Not even the fireproof buildings could escape the inferno. Still, the city and its citizens' resilience shines through and they continue on. Fires were not the only events that would test the mettle of the city of San Francisco and its inhabitants. The city would face a banking collapse in 1855 that would see the citizens of the city panicking and rushing to the doors of their banks, demanding that they be allowed to withdraw their funds. Banking was a relatively new concept to be introduced to California. Before the gold rush, the hide and tallow trade ruled the California coastal commerce. In Mexico-controlled California, sailors from around the world would swap their finished goods for the prepared cattle hides and tallow that was plentiful. The hides would then be safely stored below the decks of the ships. This direct exchange eliminated the need for a bank to be present. The tallow would be taken to South America to be sold and made into soap and candles, and the hides would be taken back east to be made into finished leather goods, such as shoes and boots. With the discovery of gold in California, the need for these newfound riches to be stored in a secure place skyrocketed. But in those days, the term banker could mean anyone who had possession of a secure safe. They legally could go into business as a bank. Once again, though, the gold rush illustrates how it's a major catalyst for change in the lifestyle and way of doing business for the people living there. The innovation and adaptation of the people in a rapidly changing environment was a sight to behold. One of the few banks that escaped the damage of the panic was Lucas Turner & Company, a St. Louis-based operation. The San Francisco branch was being managed by a man named William Tecumseh Sherman. In just a few short years, the nation would come to know this man's name as one of the leading generals of the Civil War. He would lead thousands of men into perilous battle and emerge victorious. For generations after, many in the South would recollect with much disdain Sherman's march to the sea, where he took his troops of the Union Army from the captured city of Atlanta to the port of Savannah. They destroyed almost all that crossed their path. Military targets, as well as civilian property and the South's infrastructure. Years later, Upon recounting his time as a bank manager in San Francisco, he was quoted as saying, I can handle a hundred thousand men in battle and take the city of the sun, but am afraid to manage a lot in the swamp of San Francisco. Apparently, the unpredictable nature of the city was powerful enough to cause even a man such as Sherman to become unsure of himself, if only for a moment. Sherman would also be pulled onto the city's Committee of Vigilance for a time when it re-emerged in 1856, five years after it was first established. The committee was an organization that was constructed to combat the rampant crime that was blatantly being committed in the city streets. The 1856 version of the Committee of Vigilance also set its gaze towards squelching political crimes as well as political corruption. Despite many upheavals and rapid changes, the city would continue to rebuild in every sense of the word. The resilience and perseverance of the citizens of this young city would work to counterbalance the haste in which she was first directed. The city began as a sleepy little town on the bay, but the California gold rush would do more than anything previous to spur San Francisco on to grow and to become one of the largest cities in the United States. It will continue to thrive, in part 
fueled by the aspirations of the multitudes that were drawn to the region because of gold and the promise of a better, brighter tomorrow. With every passing month, California was growing in population. The placer gold was getting harder and harder to find, but the stories of riches being pulled from the hillside were still in great abundance. Prospective miners traveled to the gold fields and would quickly learn that the game was rapidly changing. It was less and less common for a single man or a small outfit to be able to pull enough gold from the earth to sustain a living, let alone save money to return back home and be able to while away their remaining days in luxury. Large corporations were taking over, and companies were extracting the ore from beneath mountains or hydraulically washing away the hillsides. These kinds of operations required lots of manpower. Discouraged miners found themselves signing on to these larger operations and working for a day's wage. They'd come so far, traversed a nation, only to be back to working in a situation that was most likely no better than the one they'd left at home. In 1858, news of hope and a new El Dorado spread throughout California because gold had been discovered north in Canada's British Columbia. In the Fraser River Canyon, discoveries of fine flower gold had been made. There had been minor rushes in this area in the past, but word had not spread quite like this before. The Caribou Gold Rush of 1860 would attract more Canadians than the Fraser River discovery. Thus, this discovery was more of an extension of the California Gold Rush mining and the culture that surrounded it. 30,000 men who had given up hope to make their own riches in California now had a new lease on life up north. The Argonauts quickly flooded the village of Victoria, which up until that time was inhabited by only 500 people. Many of these men were unable to stake claims because of the high water on the river during the summertime months. But by autumn, many simply returned disheartened to California. They convinced themselves that the Fraser Rush held no weight. Despite this, more men would come in to replace the disappointed ones who left. All of these men who would enter the short-lived Fraser River Gold Rush would disrupt the natural order of the environment as well as the lives of the indigenous people who inhabited it, just as they were doing in California. Many of these men returned to California and continued to labor in the mines for corporations and men with larger purse strings. The placer gold was beginning to dry up, and along with it, many of the stories of larger-than-life nuggets which fueled the hearts and minds of thousands during the Gold Rush era. Advanced mining techniques such as hydraulic and river dredging were quickly becoming the norm, and the every man's chance at striking it rich was dwindling with every passing day. Entire sections of rivers would be diverted, and massive amounts of earth would be crushed to get to the smallest deposits of gold locked inside. The instantaneous discovery of pay dirt large enough to set you up for life was giving way to a more painstaking and methodical kind of mining. The strike-it-rich moment was almost gone. Located in Northern California, just 15 miles northeast of Chico, Dogtown, this small town with an odd name, would be the discovery site of the largest single nugget of gold on earth at that time. Dogtown got its namesake because of its abundance of canine inhabitants. Some of the first settlers of the area were the Bassett family, and when Mrs. Bassett first arrived to the area, she came on foot and had almost no worldly possessions save for three dogs, two female and one male. Mrs. Bassett had no luck as a prospector, yet she still had to find a way to make a living. When one of her dogs gave birth to a litter of puppies, she had an idea. She began selling her pups for a pinch of gold dust to the lonely miners who were setting up camp all around the area. These men were at a loss for some kind of companionship, and she provided it 
at a reasonable enough expense. As the town grew, there were soon dogs in every tent and cabin. Shopkeeps and saloon owners kept them as well. The name of Dogtown seemed natural and fitting. Until 1859, Dogtown remained a place that was not widely known, and the population seemed sparse at best. That all changed when A.K. Stearns, a workman, discovered a large gold nugget in the Willard claim on the slopes of Sawmill Peak. The nugget weighed in at 54 pounds, and its value was set at $10,690. That would be in the $350,000 range for modern-day money. The Dogtown Nugget quickly made headlines on many papers all across the nation, and this single find started a small gold rush of its own within the Dogtown area. The name and the legend of the Dogtown Nugget would live on, but the town's name was not long for this world. The female population of Dogtown resented the name, and especially so when they needed to use it in correspondence. The women of Dogtown, California, petitioned to have the town's name changed to Megalia, which is Latin for cottages. A plea for a name change appeared in the Marysville Appeal by a local resident. We should hate to live in a place called Dogtown, particularly if we had a large correspondence and had to write the name frequently. The name was forever changed, and gold continued to be prospected there until the 1890s. Soon, only the old-timers knew the origins of Magalia, the namesake of the Dogtown Nugget. Some 174 miles southeast of Dogtown, another gold nugget was literally stumbled upon by John William Hance as he was chasing after a runaway mule. The nugget he finds weighs in at 14 pounds, nothing compared to the Dogtown Nugget, but it would lead to one of the largest slabs of gold that the California Gold Rush would ever see. James H. Carson fought in the Mexican-American War as part of Colonel Stevenson's regiment of first New York volunteers. The regiment arrived in California in 1847. Carson saw little action during the course of the war. There were no plans made for the soldiers' return back east, so by the end of the war, the soldiers found themselves stranded in California. Carson was living in Monterey, which is just under 300 miles south of Coloma, where Marshall discovers the first nuggets of gold in the American River. It did not take long for word to reach him about the findings. He quickly packed up his belongings, along with some supplies he'd purchased, and set out for the virgin gold fields. Carson first stopped at Weber Creek in Placerville, California. He was successful in his digging, but the itch for something more led him to look elsewhere for bigger and better prospects. He joins a party of men, which included the Angel and Murphy brothers, and they collectively decided to head south. They prospected every stream they came across until they came to a creek some 60 miles south of where they'd started. Here, the group of men parted ways at what is now known as Angel's Creek. The Murphys headed eastward. Carson continued south, while the angels stayed at the creek. Carson found luck a few miles south at a small tributary of the Stanislaus. This area, rich in gold, they decided to name Carson's Creek. Despite having success in all of these places, James H. Carson still remained restless, and his desire for something bigger pulled him further south. After several years of unsuccessful prospecting, Carson decided to return to Carson's Creek and the claims that he had laid there. He goes on to be elected to the State Assembly in 1852, but rheumatism, which had plagued him for years, left him bed-stricken. The creek and the hill which bore his namesake were still successfully being mined for gold while Carson lay ill in bed. He succumbs to the illness before he can take office and dies very near poverty. James H. Carson would not live to see the largest nugget of gold pulled from the hills that bore his namesake. John William Hance, 
the man who had discovered the 14-pound lump of gold up on Carson Hill while chasing a runaway mule four years earlier in 50, immediately returned to the site to stake his claim. At that time, he did not know that the nugget which he stumbled across had broken away from a much larger quartz vein which was rooted deep within the hillside. John Hans takes a group of six partners up to the newly staked claim. There, they decide to call themselves the Carson Creek Consolidated Mining Company. Soon thereafter, the claim becomes known as the Morgan Mine, thusly named after Colonel A. Morgan, the most prominent figure in the partnership. The Morgan Mine was so abundant with gold that the prospectors used a very unusual technique to extract and retrieve the gold from the quartz bedrock. One of the partners described the method and the process as such. When the quartz vein was first worked, the method adopted was to put in a blast, and after the explosion, to go around with hand baskets and pick up the pieces. Implementing this method, the partners of the Morgan Mine pulled out $110,000 in gold from one single blast. On another occasion, the party found a lump of ore that weighed in at 112 pounds. The Morgan mine kept producing. On November 22, 1854, a slab of golden quartz was discovered. While technically not a nugget, it was massive in size. It was over 15 inches long, 6 inches wide, and 4 inches thick. The slab held a value of over $43,000. It was one of the largest ever discovered in California, yet it was only a fraction of the total bounty which miners would ultimately reap from the hill. Carson Hill of Calaveras County would produce $26 million in gold in total. There were countless stories of larger-than-life finds throughout the gold rush. In the summer of 1858, a young boy of 14 in Calaveras County discovered a nugget of gold and quartz the size of a coconut near a water wheel in the bed of a stream that had been worked over by miners, who had just happened to miss finding that gold after all those years. A 52-pound heap of gold and quartz was found in the Diltz Mine in Mariposa County, and Woods Creek in Sonora County would claim one weighing in at 75 pounds. Before a single European soul set foot in California, it's estimated that there were over 300,000 native peoples living in small tribes throughout the area. These people lived in harmony with the land, but by 1870, the number of Native Americans in California had been reduced to one-tenth of the original. The roughly 30,000 who remained in the state were for the most part displaced and the majority of them now resided on reservations, cut off from their homelands. Disease, conflict over gold, along with assimilation and an unwavering difference in their outlooks on how the land should be treated and who it belonged to, would contribute to the schism that forms between the native peoples of California and the Americans and immigrants who crossed over into her borders. With the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, a whirlwind of change was brought upon all the indigenous people of California. Until European settlers had come, and now the Americans, the diverse indigenous people of California had lived in relative peace. There were conflicts between tribes, but for the most part, these native peoples lived in villages that were sparsely populated and functioned in harmony with the world around them. The land is sacred to the native inhabitants of this great land. They take only what they need and do it in such a way that works in a delicate balance with their surroundings. The 49ers' desperate hunger for gold runs in stark contrast to the practices of these people. The Argonauts scourged the land and pulled from it only what they deemed of value, and then they left the remnants to be cast aside. So often, these remnants were the contents of rivers that had been damaged and dredged, hillsides that had been stripped of their topsoil by hydraulic water hoses, and the entrails of mountains 
which had been excavated by men who delved deep into the interior, seeking a metal which could bring them wealth. The effects of these attitudes and the actions of those who mined the gold fields of California during this rush can still be seen today. The damage these men caused was irreparable and devastating in so many ways. The hunger for gold caused so many to look no further into the future than the next payload. The land was not something they wished to live in harmony with. It was something to be conquered. It was a safe to be cracked. The natives even knew about the gold long before the whites did, but it held no value for them. With the advent of the gold rush, Americans and people from across the world would flood into the native lands and impose upon them their lifestyles as well as their beliefs and values. 1850 was the year that saw the new California legislature pass an act for the government and protection of Indians that did much to further America down the path of marginalizing, displacing, and in many instances, eradicating the native people of California. The act allowed whites to regard any American Indian that was not obviously gainfully employed and deem him a grant before a justice of the peace. These Indians could then be sold at public auction and become temporary slave laborers to whomever purchased them for a period of four months. This act also allowed whites to indenture native children, and they were often sold as apprentices. Whites continued to move Indians off their native lands and onto reservations. These people would be rounded up like cattle and forced to live in camps where they were promised food and shelter, but all too often, the white men would break their promises once the Indians were on the reservation. The American Indians lived in balance with the land and the food that it provided for them. Being carted off to a reservation, which was almost always on a tract of land that whites deemed below them to use, threw off this balance for the self-sustaining Indians. They could no longer provide for themselves, and therefore they became dependent upon the very men who uprooted them in the first place for food. These tragic displacements of people tore them from their native lands and took their dignity, forever changing their cultural landscape, much in the way that the miners did to the gold fields and the California wilderness itself with their hunger for gold, which in many cases was born out of greed and short-sightedness and haste. The entirety of the act allowed all of the following. Number one, the justice of the peace would have jurisdiction over all complaints between Indians and whites, but in no case shall a white man be convicted of any offense upon the testimony of an Indian or Indians. Two, landowners would permit Indians who were peaceably residing on their land to continue to do so. Three, whites would be able to obtain control of Indian children. This section would eventually be used to justify and provide for Indian slavery. Four, if any Indian were convicted of a crime, any white person could come before the court and contract for the Indian's services and, in return, would pay the Indian's fine. Five, it would be illegal to sell or administer alcohol to Indians. Six, Indians convicted of stealing a horse, mule, cow, or any other valuable could receive any number of lashes not to exceed 25 and fines not to exceed $200. It should be noted that the law provided that abusing an Indian child by whites was to be punished by no more than a $10 fine. It is hard to compare the penalty with the crime. 7. Finally, an Indian found strolling or loitering where alcohol was sold, begging, or leading a profligate course of life would be liable for arrest. The justice, mayor, or recorder would make out a warrant. Within 24 hours, the services of the Indian in question could be sold to the highest bidder. The term of service would not exceed four months. With all of the restrictions and harsh punishments, 
along with the ability to turn free natives into slaves, this act left those natives who managed to stay off of a reservation no better off than their brethren. If this act was not enough to make their lives troublesome at every turn, the impact that miners had on the ecosystem added insult to injury. The huge influx of people into California threw off the relationship the Indians had with the land. Food supplies ran short, game would disappear, and places where food was gathered would be replaced with mining camps and other settlements. Runoff from the camps would spill into rivers and streams, further disrupting the land. What game and agriculture did remain was battered and beaten to a pulp by the harsh mining techniques that were implemented during the rush. Gravel, silt, and chemicals such as mercury would destroy habitats and kill off fish. The Americans traveled west carrying more than pickaxes and hopes. They also brought with them illness. They introduced diseases such as smallpox, influenza, and measles, diseases that the Indians had no natural defense against. The decimation of their population by foreign diseases, destruction of natural habitat, mountains, valleys, rivers, and streams, along with the slow genocide on all fronts from the invading Americans and the government behind them, is one of the low points in American history. As California struggled with the question of slavery of blacks, they were already treating the original inhabitants as if they were less than equal to whites. Many came to California with hope in their hearts and faith that they would return home to their families able to provide a better life. All too often, this did not happen. And as a result, the best of intentions can become twisted and shaped into darker forces than their initial iteration. Violence toward Indians was born out of a simple racism and fear, but it also manifested itself in the Argonauts' frustrations and failures. When the easy placer goal becomes played out, just making ends meet in the gold fields gets harder and harder. The California dream for so many Argonauts that sought California's riches begins to fade. They turn their frustrations with their own personal failures and misguidedly take them out on the indigenous people. Indians would be killed and chased away from claims in the baseless fear that they would steal the gold. If an Indian struck out against a white miner, the retaliation was tenfold, and most often it would be directed at other Indians that had absolutely nothing to do with the original dispute. The Indians were an easy scapegoat for the whites. Instead of facing the truth about their own personal lots and accepting that they may have to return home no better off than when they set out, they chose instead to lash out again and again at those who looked, acted, and lived differently from them. In a mere 20 years, from 1849 through 1870, the population of indigenous peoples living in California would drop from 150,000 to fewer than 30,000. The pre-European numbers were in the 300,000s, so by the time of the gold rush, their populations had already been decimated. Disease, displacement, government-sanctioned enslavement and eradication were all contributing factors to this sharp decline. The California Gold Rush changed the lives of millions of people around the world, but not all of that change was for the better, and not all of the people changed began their journey willingly. There were many, many dark days when the United States and its Americans would treat their fellow man as less than equal and would cast them aside out of ignorance, pride, and for their own personal gain. Manifest Destiny, a simple, nebulous idea, which was given its name by newspaper editor John O'Sullivan in 1845, continues to fuel the subconscious of thousands of Americans and when an idea becomes so powerful that it sparks people into action, it can be a very potent thing to be reckoned with indeed.